To many who see them, the legacies of the ancients are beyond understanding. Strange creatures, exotic spirits, mysterious gods, architectural marvels. Researchers still debate their origin and meaning. They appear unearthly, alien, leading some to believe the knowledge of the ancients arrived from another world. What strange forces were at work here? Did alien gods instruct our ancestors? Or is there another explanation hidden in history? Other clues strewn through human antiquity, revealing the real ancient astronauts. All right, we'll be careful on the electrodes now. At the Monroe Institute in Virginia, there. Carol Sabick is preparing for a flight beyond her body. Need to hook these wires up to the amplifier here. Okay, does that feel comfortable for you like that? Yeah, I'm fine. All right. She's there. being launched by consciousness researcher Skip Atwater. Okay, Carol, if you're ready now, I'm going to turn the lights out. And we're ready to begin. All right, Carol, uh, everything is looking really, really good out here. I want you to continue to relax now. Atwater believes there is a hidden power in the human mind a power that once fueled the imaginations of our ancestors and may help explain some of the ancient mysteries they left behind. As the centuries have rolled by, we've forgotten some of the ancient things that we could do as humans, some of the ways in which we had of knowing things and learning things. Relaxing more and more. And when you're ready, go ahead and move on out. Mysteries of the ancient world have intrigued scholars for centuries. Perhaps the most puzzling are the suggestions of ancient flight. Why did our ancestors portray flying beings and build great stone mountains pointing to the heavens? To some, these suggest the presence of aliens of visitors from outer space who guided our ancestors. Among the ruins of lost civilizations, clues suggest a special group of people did exist. People who saw the world in a different way. But these people were not aliens. They were shamans. When we use the word shaman, we're referring to a man or a woman, or a group of men, or a group of women, who are identified by their community in some way or another to help the community. And these individuals have the special talent to alter their consciousness, to regulate their awareness, so that they can obtain information that other members of their social group cannot access. In some ways, we might say the shamans were not only the first physicians, the first healers, the first storytellers, the first creative artists, but also the first scientists. The science of the shamans may be considered crude by today's standards, but it was no less important. Some researchers believe shamans were the first to experiment with the subconscious mind, and through these experiments, set the course of human development. To understand the science of the ancient shaman, researchers must enter their laboratories. 
One such place is deep inside the Pyrenees Mountains of southern France. I think we'll probably find some paintings up there as well. I think this is the part through here. It's a long way. Yes, I think it's quite from the entrance. How far is it from the entrance now? 700 meters. 700 meters. Yeah. And these people did it without any lights at all. Well, how Very small lights. Uh, the explorers who ventured into this underground realm some 14,000 years ago experimented with an extraordinary new skill, image making. The artworks they left behind are amongst the oldest in history. The emergence of art is an important chapter in human development, signifying a new form of intelligence. There is a horse which yes. is, uh, but to researchers David Lewis Williams and Jean Clot, these images at Neo have more to tell us. To the untrained eye, the paintings depict animals of the time, animals central to the hunter-gatherer lifestyle of the artists. I'm interested in the way those two bison heads look one way and one the other way. To Lewis Williams and Clot, these images also record the presence of the shaman. Well, first of all, we've got to realize that the way in which the paintings are placed on the rock doesn't represent animals in the real world, animals standing in a field, for example. They are done one on top of the other and sometimes only in fragments. These researchers believe powerful visions inspired ancient shamans to leave their mark. Visions which emerged from the depths of their subconscious minds. They were in the world of the spirits, very far away from the natural world where people lived. And so they expected to see the spirits on the wall. And of course they saw them because they used uh, those flickering lights which made uh, the cave walls live. In one's uh, spiritual vision, the rock itself begins to disappear and to melt. Then one sees one animal after the other stretching back through an infinity of visions deep, deep into the spirit world. In an altered state of consciousness, he hears the animals and eventually sees the animals and eventually, in some instances, fixes those animals with paint and scratched lines on the wall of the cave, which is the membrane between him and the spirit world. Okay, let's go through here. These shamanic experiences could be considered humanity's first space program, an inner space program made possible by the very nature of the cave. Clot and Lewis Williams say, in dark and isolated environments, the human brain is denied stimuli from the everyday world. This sensory deprivation frees the mind, leaving it open to other influences. Incredible. That's, where the, the that's where the echoes come from, oh, yeah. these big spaces up like that, I think. And they made the With sensory the deprivation, hollow. even simple sounds can have a powerful effect on our consciousness. Of the wall. Or maybe they knew the hollows caught the sound, mm. so they put the paintings there too. Well, quite possible. Mm. Well, I think this is the sort of place that caught the echoes of, uh, of rituals. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm sure the sound must have played a big part in the ritual. Okay, let's look. Most images have been recorded in only one section of the mile and a half long cave. A place with unique acoustic properties. 90% of the animal representations are there. It's the only place in Neo where you have a special acoustics with an echo. It does work. Yes, yes. <laughs> it was just incredible. The acoustics are incredible. So is it a coincidence 
that um, the place where they put most animal representations is the only place in a two miles in in a one and a half mile long cave where uh, where you've got that kind of acoustics. I don't think so. Skip Atwater is using sound and sensory deprivation to alter Carol's state of consciousness. Inside the Monroe Institute's cave-like isolation chamber, she can see nothing, feel nothing. Her only external stimulus comes from tones in her headphones. And that sound is doing something remarkable. Just as two eyes give us binocular vision to calculate depth, our two ears allow us to calculate the direction and source of a sound, a capability vital to our ancestors' survival. Low frequency sound coming from over here would arrive at this ear first, and then a slightly different out of phase signal arrive at this ear. And if we would turn our heads towards the source, this would equalize the phase difference. When manipulated, this survival mechanism can have another powerful effect. The tones in Carol's ears are slightly out of phase, but they can't be equalized by turning her head. As a result, Carol's brain combines the sounds into a third tone, created from the difference between the original tones. This phenomenon is called binaural beating and it's modifying Carol's brain waves. Our state of consciousness is linked to brain wave activity, which can be measured by electroencephalograph or EEG. Carol's EEG shows strong activity below seven cycles per second, known as theta and delta waves. These frequencies are usually associated with dreams and sleep but Atwater says Carol's state is better described as body asleep, mind awake. All those bright colors tell us we're getting lots of delta brain waves going on as she moves into her out-of-body experience. The states of allowing your mind to travel away from your body or that has been characterized by some as an out-of-body experience of this consciousness movement is one that's characterized by this slow wave delta. So using the word sleep isn't really appropriate in this case because our minds are not asleep. Our minds are open and awake to experience. Stanley Krippner says ancient stories of flight were not inspired by aliens but by shamans. Experimenting with sensory deprivation, sound, and sometimes psychedelic plants, they learn to alter their states of consciousness, to propel them into otherworldly realms. Drumming, dancing, dreams, drugs, the four Ds of shamanism, as I often say, this produces very vivid mental imagery, visual imagery, but also auditory imagery. This becomes the material for songs, for marvelous paintings, for even architectural structures. And this is something that was the province of the shaman. David Lewis Williams and Jean Clot have no doubt sound and ritual inspired the artists of Neo. It must have been a ritual center of some sort, I think. The, deep, the deeper gallery to, to the, the gallery. They found further evidence the artists were in altered states. So now we're coming to the dots. Strange geometric patterns on the cave walls. Concave, and people put uh, paint on their fingers, and then they marked the, the rock like that. Similar patterns, known as entoptic images, are often reported by modern humans entering an altered state of consciousness. There are a limited number of geometric shapes that are wired into the human nervous system that appear in glowing forms within one's vision. 
and optic images appear superimposed over normal vision and are thought to be generated in the visual cortex, the part of the brain where signals from the eyes are processed. Dots arranged in lines and grids, crosshatches and zigzags, appear in many of humanity's oldest artworks. Professor Lewis Williams believes many of these geometric images are a record of shamans exploring the hidden depths of their minds. Another very important form is the vortex or the spiral which represents in, almost throughout the world the tunnel or the entrance to the spirit world. So that going through the vortex the shaman then comes out on the other side in a completely new spiritual realm. very different from having uh, wishful fantasies or, or be doing some daydreaming uh, you know it's a it's a literally it's an inner uh, travel comparable to the space travel pioneering consciousness researcher Stanislav Grof has spent more than four decades researching the science of the ancient shamans he says shamans also used breathing techniques to alter their consciousness. He teaches modern travelers to produce a mild form of oxygen deprivation in the brain, similar to that experienced by climbers at high altitudes. Groff believes the non-ordinary states this can produce were a fundamental part of all ancient cultures. The Western industrial civilization is really the only group of uh, people throughout human history that does not uh, hold the non-ordinary states uh, in high esteem. Every other group sort of uh, uh, has tremendous appreciation of these states and they spend a lot of uh, time and uh, energy trying to develop very safe and uh, effective ways of, of uh, inducing these non-ordinary states. Human consciousness remains largely a mystery to science. It's believed our awareness comes from a complex interaction between sensory signals, memories, and the subconscious mind. Groff and others argue the subconscious plays a more powerful role than we imagine. That we use it to develop ideas, and through the ages our ancestors used it to develop human intelligence. The ideas, the inspiration that can come from an ordinary state can help later when the person returns into the ordinary state, you know, to uh, substantially improve one's uh, way of being in the world. Advocates of this theory suggest inspirational ideas can come from a transpersonal realm, hidden from everyday awareness. That the dreamlike imagery in altered states often contain solutions to the questions on our minds. Many people in the transpersonal field feel that uh, all genuine, really deep creativity comes from the transpersonal realms. Obviously, you have to do your homework. I mean, you have to sort of uh, uh, consume somehow the, the information of a particular discipline. You have to be aware of the problems, you have, to, you have to define them very clearly, but the solution very frequently comes uh, in a non-ordinary state. Some of modern science's great discoveries have occurred in dreamlike flights of the imagination. In 1862, after dreaming of a snake biting its tail, chemist Auguste Kekula predicted the circular structure of the benzene molecule, a breakthrough vital to understanding the chemistry of life. Molecular researcher Dr. Carrie Mulis started a genetic revolution in the 1990s when he designed an innovative DNA cloning technique. He credits the discovery to an altered state's flight along a strand of DNA. Even Albert Einstein claimed some of his theories, including the groundbreaking theory of relativity, came to him while he was in a twilight state. I think there's a great deal of evidence that intelligence 
originally was quite modular, very much like a Swiss Army knife, where each blade, each part of the knife, has a specific task to perform. The shaman probably pulled all of these factors together better than anybody else in the society. All right, Carol, come on back now. Come on back to the booth here in the lab. It's time to be ending the session. You've been gone quite a while now. Come on back. That's better. I can see that you're back now. Very good. Well, welcome back. How was your experience? Oh, wow. Um, I started out from here sort of floating up through the, the roof of this, through the ceiling, and I went up out through the building, and I was looking at the building from up above. And then it was like I flew over the, the whole scenery here up to like a cabin that, that's up on the hill, and I was looking at the cabin from the outside. And then from there, I was out in, in this space that all of a sudden I felt this being come close to me and couldn't really see it. I could just sort of feel this energy. Carol's altered state's encounter may help explain the origins of many ancient beliefs. In another age, it may have earned her a reputation for special powers. The ability to fly to a realm of spirits and gods and return with inspiration and ideas. Flying dreams are sometimes associated with venturing to other realms and collecting information. And yet the dream imagery of flying may in fact be somewhat of a metaphor, somewhat of a symbol that we use to explain to ourselves the way in which we got the information. Now this symbology may have been similarly placed in ancient times when people were seen to be dressed as birds. The mark of the Birdman can be found amongst the remains of many great ancient cultures, including one that heralds the birth of a new era in human history. In Turkey, archaeologists study the oldest urban settlement yet discovered, Shatel Hoyuk. I was doing for between the walls, yeah, and so I saw that actually a big, a big, a big area of info there. Built 9,000 years ago, its honeycomb of mud brick houses sprawled over 30 acres. This site marks a turning point in human development, the dawn of civilization. Here we find the first evidence of organized agriculture alongside traditional hunting and gathering. So at this very, very important moment uh, in human development, uh, when they shift from a, a hunter-gatherer mobile way of life to a, a settled farming way of life, we get an insight into their beliefs, their ideas, their thoughts, their perceptions of the world. Uh, and uh, that, that's why perhaps Chattahoyuk holds the key to an understanding of this important uh, shift in human history. Project director Professor Ian Hodder says shamanic ritual played a central role in life at Chattahoyuk. Excavations reveal many of the houses were also used as shrine rooms. We can visit them today in virtual reality. One entered them by going down a ladder into a chamber and then one crawled through a small opening into a deeper chamber and then through another small opening into a deeper chamber. Professor Lewis Williams believes shamans associated the underworld of caves with their ability to fly. But at Chattel Hoyhook, he says they no longer relied on nature's launch pads. They built their own. And the fact that these, uh, in some ways, replicated caves and entrances to the underworld is perhaps confirmed by the fact that the people who made them 
actually got stalactites and stalactites from caves some distance away, carried them down to Chattelhuyuk and took them into the deep parts of the cave. So they were making their own caves above the earth. In these rooms, researchers believe shamans perform their rituals, entered altered states of consciousness, and flew to the spirit realm. from this culture was the concept of an afterlife. With permanent settlement and agriculture, the power of animal spirits diminished. They were gradually replaced with human spirits, the spirits of the dead. Now that animals were domesticated, they lost their mystique. And instead, there was more of a reliance on ancestors from the spirit world for help. As the beliefs of the shamans changed, so would their altered states' experiences. They buried the dead under platforms within the houses, and to communicate with their spirits, shamans now journeyed to a different realm, a realm in the skies above. There is evidence that, uh, that humans may have been dressing up as vultures. In one of the paintings, the, the vulture figures seem to have human uh, legs. Our interpretation of the art is that it, what it's telling us about is, is sort of mythical, a mythical process of relationship with the, the ancestors, perhaps through, through flight and through, through birds who take flesh and, uh, and who go to a higher, higher world. After experiencing the sensation of flight, shamans would describe it to their communities. Their extraordinary tales could explain how the afterlife became such a powerful belief in many ancient cultures, and the motivation behind some of the greatest architectural achievements of the ancient world. On the remote island of Orkney, north of Scotland, is the remains of an ancient village called Skara Bray. Built around 3100 BC, it was occupied for some 600 years. As at Chattelhoyuk, it's thought shamans here believed they could commune with the dead. But at Skara Bray, shamanic flights to the afterlife were not launched from simple shrine rooms. On ancient Orkney, the people used launch pads of unprecedented sophistication. This grave, known as Maze Howe, is one of the finest structures of prehistoric Europe. Its simple grass covering hides a chamber built from a complex arrangement of stone. Orkney shamans are thought to have come here to receive inspiration and knowledge from the dead. One extraordinary feature of this site you cannot see, you can only feel. Helmholtz resonance is the, the effect that you get when you blow across the neck of a bottle. So. And that's the, the same effect that we'd expect to get in a tomb like Maze Howe, with the column of air in the neck of the bottle being the column of air in the passage, and then the, the sort of volume of the bottle being the actual main chamber of the tomb. Dave Keating and Aaron Watson from Reading University in England have come to measure the acoustic effects in Maze Howe. It's possible the Helmholtz resonance inside this passage grave could alter the consciousness of those within and explain why ancient Europeans believed they could talk to the dead. 
Tests with the scale model suggest the sound frequencies produced here could be around two cycles per second, well below the audible range. Human hearing only goes down to around about 20 hertz and at frequencies below that we tend to, to feel the sensation you know, in the body cavity shake and things like that and as the frequencies get lower we become less and less aware of them but uh, it's been shown that they can still have a very profound effect on us so we may not even be aware that they're there and they're still affecting us. Okay Aaron, um, I think what we'll try doing is if you just take the drum and give a good waft yeah, and then we can see what frequency the air... So near the entrance to the passage then? Yeah, just give me one okay. good waft. By simply waving a drum, the Reading team set a pulse of air bouncing back and forth across the chamber. That's lovely. A resonant pulse of inaudible sound. So that shows us the resonant frequency of the whole tune. OK. Is, is this about 1.6 hertz? So by moving the air once... It's created this reaction that continues. That's right. I think probably what we want to try now is you at the entrance of the, the tunnel. To test their theory further, Keating and Watson introduced the repetitive sound of a drum, the instrument most likely used during rituals at the site. OK, Aaron, I've got the DAT running so you can start drumming any time you want. Two drum beats per second, the same frequency at which the tomb resonates, produces a strong reading on their instruments. Not from the sound of the drum beat, but from the inaudible Helmholtz resonance. Here you can see the, the drum beats, but look in between, you can see this lovely Helmholtz resonance. Yeah. You see that? And that's, that's the whole tomb just resonating away each time you yeah. kick it you with the really, drum. You can really see that, can't you? Yeah. The actual sound pressure levels that, that we measured in Mays Howe, um, we had about 135 decibels. Now, uh, if, if you sort of equate that to a, an audible frequency, that's a very, very loud sound, you know, equivalent to, to something like a jet engine, louder than a rock concert. Um, of course, you can't even hear it, <laughs> but it's there at this extremely high level. Could this powerful resonance alter the brain waves of those in the chamber? Keating and Watson are about to find out. Wired to a portable EEG, David Keating assumes the role of the shaman. After a few minutes of drumming, David's brain waves have begun to slow, showing heightened theater activity typical of the twilight state at the edge of sleep. As the drumming continued for a while, I could feel as though my body was going asleep. Now, normally if you're dropping off, you kind of lose focus and concentration and come to suddenly as, as your head nods forward. But in, in this instance, I, I was aware of my head dropping forward slowly and snatching back again, as though I was a, an outside observer of my own body. Dave? How do you feel? I feel fine. Uh, it was odd. I, I, I could feel my, my body falling asleep, mm. but my brain was still awake, still with it. You know? Right. The results at Mays Howe don't surprise consciousness researcher Skip Atwater. He believes over thousands of years, from the first caves to the elaborate tombs, shamans were refining the power of sound to send them on journeys beyond the body. That's why we see these very interesting slow beating instruments by the ancients, whether they be didgeridoos setting up a harmonic vibration, whether they be rhythmic drumming, or the raking of just shells across a rough surface in order to create a rhythmic sound in the lower frequency ranges. Atwater suggests Altered states may be the key to solving the most debated ancient mystery of all time. The origins of the pyramids. In 
In a valley in the Mexican highlands lies the ancient city of Teotihuacan, the city of the gods. A vast complex, once covering eight square miles, it is regarded as Mesoamerica's first metropolis. Some have explained the pyramids here as the work of aliens, but they can also be explained as the ultimate symbol of shamanic flight. On the city's main avenue, known as the Way of the Dead, sits the Pyramid of the Sun, an extraordinary machine designed to project spirits from an underworld cave to the heavens and the afterlife. Teotihuacan was the sacred city of central Mexico, so it was a model of the cosmos, of the Mesoamerican cosmos. It was uh, conceived as a, a three-level entity with an underworld, a terrestrial space, in a celestial sphere. So the pyramid itself should be on top of a cave or a tunnel because that's the symbol of the underworld of the pyramid itself, like a stair going up to the skies. Some appearing to fly. Their strangeness has convinced some observers these beings must have been extraterrestrials. But could these figures be inspired by shamans as they performed rituals to enter altered states of consciousness? And to be kind of careful about Skip Atwater has there. come to explore that possibility. So we're just going to snap this on like this. Using a portable EEG monitor, he'll record the brainwave activity of Mexican musician Augustin Pimentel top of the head up to the crown. Augustin is about to participate in a musical ritual at the city's sacred center. Okay, I'm uh, now going to check the electrode connections with the Compumetix portable EEG machine moving from its original design and measuring sleep cycles in outer space on the space shuttle to now moving and testing the dimensions of the mind and inner space. Teotihuacan's priests conducted rituals in many caves beneath the city. The most revered of all, the cave below the Pyramid of the Sun. A gateway to the underworld, extending 330 feet into the earth. Augustin and his group, Tribu, will perform their sacred music using traditional instruments, many replicated from archaeological finds. We have found many different instruments uh, coming from the site, so uh, we have an idea that uh, music was a very important component of that society, maybe used ceremonially, ritually. <laughs> The cave reverberates with music for the first time in centuries.
as tribute bring the underworld to life, the musicians are exposed to a complex mix of frequencies and phases as sound waves bounce off the cave walls. Augustine's EEG recordings should reveal what effect this may have on his state of consciousness. Within 20 minutes, that effect becomes clear. Atwater's instruments show Augustine entered a delta state. Notice here where there's absolutely no body movement artifact. It's as though this person is totally asleep here with this high amplitude delta brain waves going across here all the way to the end of the ceremony. We went into a sacred place and repeated, replicated a ceremony that purportedly allowed these ancient peoples to travel, to see, to enter into deep meditative states, deep consciousness states that we characterize today as being akin to being asleep and yet having our minds awake. Separated from the Mexican pyramids by thousands of miles and thousands of years are the pyramids of Egypt. Some explain their uncanny similarity as the work of alien overseers. But this could also be explained by a common desire to travel from the underworld to the heavens through shamanic flight. You have to go in depth to the mind of the Egyptian and the thinking and the thoughts to understand how they did that. But today, most of the people who believe in the spiritual value of pyramids, they look at it only from outside. And this is why they began to imagine no one can do it. Like the people of ancient Mexico, ancient Egyptians believed in a cosmos with three tiers. The underworld, the earthly, and the heavens. Both societies were ruled by god kings, steeped in shamanic knowledge and belief. As in Mexico, when an Egyptian pharaoh died, he sought to join the gods in the heavens above. The ancient Egyptian believe that the king is resting in his place, and the king will use the pyramid as stairs to ascend and descend to the sky. These stairways to the stars are marvels of engineering and design. But beneath their complexity lies a concept shared by the builders of Chateau Hoyek, Mays Howe, and Teotihuacan. Deep within the pyramids of Giza, cave-like chambers were used to launch flights to the spirit world, flights fueled by sound and ritual. close the body of the deceased inside the tomb, rituals started in a glory, mysterious, darkness music. This is ritual music. Making the dancing boom, boom, beautiful. And this is what we call ritual dancing, to accompany the deceased in his funeral procession while they're taking his body. 
Could these sounds and ceremonies have been inspired by past journeys to inner space? Journeys into altered states where inspiration and wisdom were thought to be found. It could explain the motivation behind the most elaborate caves in human history. And the symbols of flight associated with the Pharaoh's journeys to the afterlife. The pyramid's secrets lie in their inspiration. An inspiration that seems to have started long before the rise of the great Egyptian powers. An inspiration shared by all ancient cultures as they explored the world of spirits and the afterlife. They were ordinary people like us. They were not giants. They were not people who came from out of the space. They were normal people, but they designed a specific program for the afterlife. History shows our ancestors, from the first cave dwellers to the most sophisticated architects, gave preeminence to the spiritual world. If that world was hidden in the human subconscious, we could still explore it today. Skip Atwater believes we can, and that we have much to learn from the ancient science of the shaman. There is information elsewhere. There is information beyond the limitations of the physical body, beyond the limitations of our five physical senses. And it is our mind that gives us access to those things. It is our very own thoughts. It is the essence of us, the soul of us, that allows us to know these things. I believe that there are two modes of, of learning about the universe. And what's fascinating to me is that, like our experiences uh, in everyday consciousness using the senses, this other mechanism can also convey absolutely new information. Now as we move into technology and understand more about how the brain functions, we are remembering, bringing together again, the functions of the lower brain and the higher brain to make us a totally functioning human being, capable of perceiving in many different ways, capable of allowing our minds to extend beyond the realms of our physical bodies. The ancient shamans seem to have used their higher and lower brains with extraordinary impact on human development. They were first to turn their imagination into images, giving birth to art and writing. The importance of the appearance of imagery just cannot be overemphasized. It, it is one of those factors that changed human society forever. Genetic biological evolution reached its peak at a certain point in time which was then manifested by the capacity for symbolic art and metaphorical storytelling. At that point there was a shift. At that point evolution became social rather than biological. For thousands of years this social evolution was guided by the shamans. Wise men and women thought to have superhuman access to the spiritual realms. What we're talking about is evolution. And we are very fortunate that the shaman and the community had this respect for the information from the other worlds to help them survive in a world that was often hostile. Fusing knowledge of the physical world with their spirit world, they offered structure and meaning to dawning civilizations. Intelligent and innovative civilizations whose remarkable achievements intrigue us today. I'm very amused by people who say that the great pyramids of the world must have been transmitted by aliens from outer space. I think that this is very naive 
human beings had the intelligence back then to do these marvelous architectural works. Two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis. A modern astronaut's brain capacity is identical to that of an ancient shaman. For 40,000 years, the only evolutionary change to the human brain has been the ideas within. The more we discover the true nature of our minds, the more we may come to understand the ancients. Where once we saw alien gods, we may finally see the real ancient astronauts, our very own and very human ancestors. I've seen the pyramids of Mexico, I've seen the pyramids of Egypt, I've seen the caves of southern France, incredible works of art. For all we know, the aliens came to learn from us.